you know, special senses include the visual system, auditory system, olfactory system, and gustatory system. In last lecture, I talked about the visual system, right? So today, I'll talk about the other three special senses. Your olfactory system, your gustatory system, and the auditory system. Olfactory system is responsible for olfaction. That means what? Smell. Gustatory system is responsible for taste, gustation. And auditory system is responsible for hearing. Listen. So we'll talk about those three sensory systems. Remember, all sensory systems have peripheral organs and central part. For example, for your visual system, peripheral organs are your two eyes. Make sense? And central part is located inside the central nervous system. Okay? So, your auditory system also has peripheral organs to ear, right? And central part inside the brain, central nervous system. For olfactory system, peripheral organ is what? Nose, right? And for gustatory, tongue. Make sense? For taste. So those are the peripheral, peripheral organs. And central part is located inside the central nervous system, C and S. <clears throat> so first, we'll talk about the olfaction, or a smell perception, perception of smell. <clears throat> Nose is the peripheral organ. We'll see the structure of the nose. Inside the nose, you have the nasal cavity. And in the upper part of your nasal cavity, you have olfactory epithelium in the roof part, okay, or ceiling part of the nasal cavity. In this area, you have olfactory epithelium, okay. And inside the olfactory epithelium, you have the olfactory receptor cells, very important, okay. So, what happens, you know, when you smell something, the smell molecules float in the air and enter into the nose. Do you see it? Do you see the smell molecules floating? No, because they are extremely very small, okay? So, they are so small, those molecules, that you don't see, but they can, they float in the air and enter into the nose. Make sense? And bind with the receptors in the olfactory epithelium. Okay? And when that happens, the smell molecule and receptor binding occurs, the signal, electrical signal is produced and that travels to the brain. So that's the idea. Okay? So you see here, smell molecules enter into the nose and bind with the receptors here in the olfactory epithelium and that triggers the electrical signal. <clears throat> From the receptors, the signal travels through the olfactory nerve fibers. So these are the olfactory nerve fibers take the signal from the epithelium receptors in the epithelium to the olfactory bulb. Have you seen olfactory bulb? Anybody remember? When you did the dissection, right? Of sheep brain, you saw the olfactory bulb, right? So, signal from the receptors is taken to the olfactory bulb via the olfactory nerve fibers. Now, you must remember Cribriform plate of ethmoid. 
when you saw the skull. That cubiform plate has tiny holes. Remember olfactory foramina? When you saw the skull bone. So this is the cribriform plate of ethmoid. And there are many tiny olfactory foramina, right, in that bone. So these olfactory nerve fibers pass through the cribriform plate. So the olfactory foramina and enter into the olfactory bulb because olfactory bulb is just sitting on the cribriform plate. Make sense? So these are the holes, right? So the nerve fibers pass through the foramina and enter into the olfactory bulb. So then from the olfactory bulb, the signal is taken to different brain structures by the olfactory tract. Tract is the bundle of fibers or axons. So you also have seen olfactory tract. Remember that? Olfactory bulb, olfactory tract. So from the olfactory bulb, the signal, smell signal, is taken to different brain structures by the olfactory tract. Okay? Got the idea? So first let's start again. Smell molecules, right? float in the air and enter into the nose, right? And in the upper part of the nasal cavity, you have olfactory what? Epithelium, right? Yeah. Where you have the receptors, clear? So the molecules will bind with the receptors. You know, key lock type binding. So the receptors will be activated, will produce electrical signal that will pass, uh, uh, that will uh, travel through the olfactory nerve fibers, right? and nerve fibers pass through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone, right? Through olfactory foramina and enter into the olfactory bulb, which is sitting on it, right? And from there, the tract takes the signal to different brain structures, not only one, different brain structures, okay? So, which brain structures receive the signal from the olfactory tract? Olfactory cortex, hypothalamus, amygdala, and limbic system. These four structures, brain structures, receive the smell signal. Now, why not one? Why four? The reason is different <coughs> structures perform different functions. Make sense? Different brain parts perform different functions. Olfactory cortex gives you the perception of smell. Olfactory cortex gives what? Perception of, Perception of smell. That means what? If it is orange or banana or mango, right? This smell, immediately you can tell, right? This is mango. This is orange, right? That is the perception, the smell perception. What is this? Make sense? First thing. Hypothalamus and hypothalamus, this structure, is mainly responsible for memory, olfactory memory. Now, what is that? You know, if uh, when you are, you are very small, you know, uh, your mom used to cook for you food, prepare food for you. Now, after many years, you did not eat your mom's cooking um, uh, food. Uh, now, if you suddenly eat or smell, right, smell that food, you can tell, right? You can tell that. When I was very small, I used to eat, you know, uh, this food, this smell, uh, you can uh, detect. So that's the memory, make sense? That you smelled that before. It's a pretty strong, right? You know that, it's pretty strong. Uh, when I think movie theater, I smell popcorn, okay? So uh, that's the memory, right? You know that. Uh, that smell is there. In that area, if you enter, you will smell it, right? So that's the olfactory memory, hypothalamus. Amygdala and limbic system, these two structures are responsible for olfactory emotion. You know, when a small baby, infant, cries during sleep, if mom goes close to the baby, stops crying, right? The baby can smell mother's body, right? So emotionally connected, right? 
so uh, again I can give same example your mom's cooking cooked food right after 30 years if you eat right you can get emotional that your mom used to cook for you so affection is very much related to what memory and emotion Make sense? so that's why you need the brain structures those are responsible for memory and emotion not only perception one important uh, information here is you know that thalamus is the major sensory relay station right i mentioned it before almost all sensory signals are relayed in the thalamus but i said almost all that is not all right so olfactory signal is not relayed in the thalamus it bypasses thalamus this is an exception how come Why not? Yeah. Th th there are several other relay stations for olfaction. So it, it just, you know, uh, you know, uh, this is the olfactory bulb here, right? And from the bulb, those structures are very close. That, you know, uh, um, uh, olfactory cortex, amygdala limbic system, right? Uh, those structures are very close to the olfactory bulb. So it doesn't need to go to thalamus and come back. It can just go there. Okay, now olfactory epithelium. If you see the olfactory epithelium, you have olfactory receptor cells that I have mentioned already. These are the olfactory receptor cells. Those are neuron-like cells. You know, dendrite, axon, and two other types of cells are also present there: basal cells and supporting cells. So if I ask you in olfactory epithelium how many different types of cells you have, three types, right? Olfactory receptor cells, those are the main cells, and you also have basal cells and supporting cells. Basal cells are stem cells. So basal cells are stem cells, and they can produce new cells. You know stem cells produce new cells, right? Why you need stem cells there? You know that infection occurs, right? Inside the nose, uh, the cells die in the olfactory epithelium. So new cells must be produced there to replace the dead cells. Make sense? Otherwise, your smell perception will, you know, deteriorate. So you need the stem cells there. Make sense? To quickly replace the dead cells. Uh, so those are three types of cells. Now, the olfactory receptor cells are neuron-like cells. That means there's a cell body, long axon, and dendrite. Okay. This is olfactory receptor neuron or cell. Why this is called receptor cell? Because it has receptors. Receptors are attached to the cilia at the end of the dendrite. So this is dendrite. This is axon. At the end of the dendrite, you have cilia, soft hair-like structures. And these are the receptors. So receptors and receptor cells are two different things. This whole thing is the cell, right? Receptor cell. And these tiny structures are what? Receptors. Make sense? So that's why this, this cell is called receptor cell, because it has receptor somewhere. So these are the receptors. Okay? Now, the smell molecules enter into the nose. So these are the small mo smell molecules. Okay? float in the air and enter into the nose and perfectly bind with these receptors because these receptors are for the smell molecules. Okay? So when that binding occurs, electrical signal is produced and travels this way. Okay? Make sense? Okay. Now, these axons are actually olfactory nerve fibers. So you see here, these axons are the olfactory nerve fibers. They pass through the cubiform plate of the ethmoid bone. 
Okay, and enter into the output field now. Okay, so now inside the output field ball, which is sitting on the QB from plate, you have the neurons, and those neurons are called mitral cells. Mitral cells are the neurons inside the olfactory form. Is it clear? Okay. So mitral cells, dendrites of mitral cells receive the signal from the axons of the receptor cells. So you see here, the axon terminal of the receptor cell and dendrites of the mitral cell. They form synapses, you know synapses, right? And those synapses are called glomeruli. Those synapses are called what? Glomeruli. Is it clear? <coughs> so the signal is taken to the mitral cells, and the axons of mitral cells look all the way to the top left. The axons of mitral cells bundle together to form the olfactory tract. So olfactory tract is the bundle of the axons of mitral cells. You said mitral cells are the neurons of the olfactory system? Olfactory bulb. Cool. Makes sense, right? OK. So now you've got the olfactory tract, which is the bundle of the axons of mitral cells. Okay. Olfactory tract takes the signal to those four brain structures. Remember I said olfactory cortex, right? Hippocampus, then what? Limbic, uh, uh, amygdala and limbic system. Those four brain structures, right? Olfactory cortex is for olfaction, immediate perception of smell. What is that, right? Orange or banana or rose or you know uh, anything else. And then uh, hippocampus is responsible for memory, olfactory memory. Amygdala and limbic system are responsible for emotion. Okay. So that's how the olfactory system works. Gustatory system or taste system. The peripheral organ is what? Tongue, right? And you know, on the surface of the tongue, if you see the tongue, on the surface of the tongue, you have many tiny dot-like structures. Did you notice that? Okay, those are called papilla. You can see those tiny dots on the surface mm -hmm. of the tongue. <clears throat> there are four different types of papilla on the tongue. In the front part of the tongue, you have those tiny papilla, two different types, filiform, and fungiform. So those two types of papilla, those are very tiny and present in the, distributed in the front part of the tongue. Other two types of papilla are present in the back part of the tongue, where these are called circumvallate papilla in the back part of the tongue. Circumvallate papilla. Okay? They line up in a way that form inverted V, <coughs> inverted V-shaped arrangement. Make sense? So it looks like inverted V. And they are not many. They are larger and 8 to 16 in number. So not so many, just 8 to 16. And present in the back part of the tongue and form inverted V, circumvallate. And in both sides of the back part of the tongue, you have another type of papilla like this. And these are called foliate. Foliate papillas. So you see, uh, 
filiform and fungiform. Those are very tiny and distributed in the uh, front part of the tongue and circumvallate and foliate in the back part of the tongue. Circumvallate are larger and 8 to 16 in number form inverted V uh, and foliate in both sides in the back part of the tongue. Among these four, this one doesn't have any taste receptors, no taste receptors. Okay, no taste receptors in filiform. In other three types of papilla, you have taste receptors. Make sense? <clears throat> so those are papilla. Now if I open the papilla, inside the papilla, I will find taste bar. So taste bar is like this. Inside the taste bar, you have taste receptor cells. You must have receptor cells. So they are located inside the taste bar. So these are the taste receptor cells, like slices in the orange. Okay? So I'm drawing different types of taste receptor cells. So I'm gonna try it. So these are taste receptor cells, nucleus. And this whole thing is the taste bar, which is like an orange, of course not that big, very small, but you can see under microscope, right, and open it. It's like an orange. And you know, if you uh, remove the skin of the orange, what do you see inside? Slices, right? So it is like this. Inside the taste bar, you have slices, and these are the receptor cells. Receptor cells. Okay. Now, inside a taste bar, you have different receptor cells. For example, this is for sweet. This is for sour. This is for what? Bitter. Make sense? This is for spicy. Spicy or umami, you know. Have you heard this word? No. Yes. This is the taste of protein. Protein. Very tasty. It came from Japanese scientists who first proposed this. So anyway, so different tastes, right? are processed in different receptor cells. Okay? <clears throat> now, at the top part of the receptor cells, you have hair. These are the hair. receptor cells. And these here are not very soft. That's why not cilia, we say here. Okay. Now you know receptor cells contain what? Why they are called the receptor cells? Because they have receptors. Remember I said because they have receptors. In case of olfaction, Receptors are attached to the cilia. Remember that? Attached to the cilia. In case of gustation, the receptors are attached to the hair. So these are the receptors. Very tiny protein structures. So these are the receptors here. That's why these are receptor cells, because they have receptors on the hair. Now, this is the tongue. So when you put the food, on the tongue, salivary secretion occurs, so water gets mixed with the food, right, saliva, and that helps 
the food molecules pour through the opening here. This opening is called taste pore. Okay? So on the top of the taste bar, you have an opening, small opening that is called the taste pore, through that the liquid food enters into the taste bar. And food molecules bind with these receptors. That is the most important thing. Food molecules bind with the receptors. When that binding occurs, electrical signal is produced. Always. Okay? So that is important. So electrical signal will be produced and will get out through the axons of these cells. You know, these cells are neuron like cells. All receptor cells are neuron like cells. So they have axons. So these axons take the signal, electrical signal, out from the tongue. Make sense? Out from the tongue. Head towards the brain. Okay? So that is the gustation. Yeah. Two nerves take the signal out from the tongue. So these fibers form two nerves bundled together to form two cranial nerves, facial and glossopharyngeal. Remember I said glosso, if you listen glosso, that indicates what? Tongue. Remember? The muscles. So glossopharyngeal and facial. Those two cranial nerves take the taste signal from the tongue to the medulla oblongata. You remember medulla oblongata, okay? And from outside of the tongue, another cranial nerve, that is the vagus nerve. This is not from the tongue. Outside of the tongue, you have a small number of taste receptors, okay? Uh, of course, we know that taste receptors are in the tongue, right? But outside of the tongue, you have a small number of taste receptors, so from there, uh, the vagus nerve takes the signal. So these are the three cranial nerves take the signal, taste signal to the medulla oblongata. Two from the tongue, one from the outside of the tongue. Facial is cranial nerve number seven. This is facial. And glossopharyngeal is cranial nerve number nine. And vagus is cranial nerve number 10. So these three cranial nerves, number 7, number 9, number 10. That means facial, glossopharyngeal, and vagus. Take the taste signal to a structure in the medulla oblongata. That is structure you must remember. The name of it is solitary nucleus. Solitary Nucleus. Also called tractus solitaricus. Same thing. If you hear tractus solitaricus, also called solitary nucleus. Same thing. Okay. In the medulla oblongata. And from there, the relay takes place there, and from there, Signal goes to thalamus because thalamus is the major sensory relay station, remember? So most, almost all sensory signals are relayed in the thalamus. So from the solitary nucleus, signal goes to the thalamus where it is relayed again, and from the thalamus goes to the gustatory cortex in the brain. Okay? So, gustatory cortex receives the signal to give you the perception of taste. What is that? Right? Is it, uh, uh, you know, butter or cheese or something else, right? Or meat or milk, right? The taste is given by the cortex, gustatory cortex. Now, again, you see here, <coughs> hypothalamus and limbic system. Those structures also receive the signal. 
limbic system is very much related to emotion that I mentioned, right? Limbic system, amygdala, are related to what? Emotion. So food is also connected to emotion, right? I said that if you smell, not only smell, if you taste the food that you know, um, you like, that, that connects you uh, to your memory. Okay, so those <coughs> two are special senses, olfactory and gustatory. Then another one is the auditory. Auditory system consists of peripheral organs, to what? Yes. Okay. So, first we will see the anatomy of the ear, structure of the ear. Your ear has three parts, external ear or outer ear, middle ear and inner or internal ear. And <coughs> this is the external or outer ear consists of pinna or auricle, helix, lobule, and then external acoustic meatus. That's a canal, outer ear canal, this one. So those belong to the external ear. Now, this structure is called the tympanic membrane or ear drum. Have you heard that? Ear drum or tympanic membrane. It is a thin, extremely thin membrane that vibrates like this. Okay, now in some books you will see that tympanic membrane, uh, they have included this one in external ear. Okay, in some books uh, they have included it in middle ear. I would prefer to say that tympanic membrane is the partition between external and middle ear. Make sense? Okay, so if I ask you, the partition is the tympanic membrane that separates two, external and middle ear. Okay. Then, middle ear. This is middle ear, which is actually a cavity inside the temporal bone. You remember temporal bone? This bone, right? Here, yeah, temporal bone. Inside the temporal bone, middle ear is a cavity. But this cavity contains three tiny, very small bones. Three tiny what? Small bones. Tiny or small bones. Those are called ossicles. So, middle ear cavity contains three ossicles, right? Three tiny bones. And two tiny muscles. Make sense? So, <coughs> that's the middle ear. Then, you see here, tiny bones. One, two, three. Muscles they did not show here. There are two muscles. You see that. Now the inner ear. Inner ear is the most important part because cochlea, which contains the sound receptor cells, cochlea contains what? Sound receptor, sound receptor cells. Right. So receptor cells are the most important. You remember when I talked about the eye? I said that. Retina is the most important. Why? Because photoreceptors are there, right? Rods and cones. Make sense? So cochlea is very important because it contains sound receptor cells. Okay? Those are called hair cells. Okay, cochlear hair cells. So this is the cochlea in the inner ear. Cochlea is a snail like. Have you seen snail? Snail like hard coil shaped fluid filled structure. So, few things I have mentioned. Shape is what? Snail like. Snail -like. It is hard or soft? Hard. 
hard bony structure, bone, bone like a structure, and filled with what? Fluid. So, snail like, hard, coiled, fluid filled structure. That's the cochlea. Inside the cochlea, you have hair receptor cells. Is it clear? And those cells are called the hair cells. Two other important structures are inside the inner ear. This part is called the vestibule, and these are semicircular canals, tubes. So, vestibule and semicircular canals. So, cochlea contains sound receptor cells. These sound receptor cells are called what? Hair cells. Make sense? And other two structures are what? Vestibule, vestibule and semicircular canals. Now, this one is responsible for sound, right? Because sound receptor cells are inside it. So if cochlea uh, damage occurs, if cochlea is destroyed, then what will happen? The person will not yeah. hear. Make sense? Clear. <clears throat> so these two structures are not related to sound. These two structures are related to head position. Maintaining balance of the body. Which way you tilt your head, right? That can be detected by these two structures. Is it clear? Vestibule and semicircular canal. Because if you tilt your head, right? These structures, all these structures are filled with fluid. Filled with what? Sorry. Fluid. All these three. Now, think that this is a semicircular canal. It is a, it is a tube, okay? Now, if you tilt your head, it will move like this, right? In your ear. So the fluid is partially filled with fluid. The fluid will also move. Make sense? So by detecting, you have the sensors inside this. So they can detect which way the fluid is moving. Make sense? And that is telling the brain that which way the head is moving. Make sense? So when you move your head, the fluid also moves. Inside. Okay? So that's how the head position is, signal is given to the brain, and brain can maintain the balance. Is it clear? Now, if these are destroyed, then what will happen? Right. Your balance will be lost, right? Vertigo. Even, you know, small lesion can cause what? Vertigo. So, this is responsible for sound, and these two are not, right? These two are responsible for balance. <clears throat> That's why you see two different nerves take the signal out from these structures, not same nerve. Make sense? So this one is attached to the cochlea. So this one is for what? Sound. Make sense? And this is vestibular nerve, not cochlea. This is cochlear nerve. This is what? Vestibular nerve. This is for the position signal. Okay? So two different nerves take the signal to the brain. Now, let me explain how the sound signal travels to the ear. Your auricle or pinna is doing what? It is like a funnel, right? Here, like a funnel, capturing the sound waves. Sound is what? If I, if I hit something, you listen to the sound, right? When I hit something, when something moves, what happens in the air? Vibrations. Vibrations, right? And that produces waves. Make sense? If I move like this, something, right? In the air, waves will be created. So, the waves enter into the air through the, through the external acoustic meters. So this one captures the sound waves and 
funnels it through the external acoustic meters. And those waves come one after another in very high frequency, right? One after another. In human auditory system, we can detect the sound between 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. 20 hertz means in one second, 20 waves. Make sense? In one second, how many waves? 20. Now tell me, 20 kilohertz means what? In one second, how many? How many thousand? 20,000. 20, so now you can think, think, right? In one second of time, 20,000 waves enter into that ear. Okay? So it's a really very high frequency, right? Human auditory system cannot detect above 20 kilohertz. But some creatures like bats, they can detect 100 kilohertz, okay? So very high frequency, right? They can listen. We don't. Which is good or bad? Good. Good. Why good? It will be painful. It will be painful. Uh, but even if your ear is designed uh, that way, it's not painful. Still, it's a problem because so many different sounds are around you. You don't listen many of those which is good, right? Otherwise, your brain will get crazy. Like so many different sounds, you know? Radio frequency, TV frequency, this frequency, that frequency, right? And some creatures are producing uh, uh, ultrasonic, right? Infrasonic sounds. You don't want to listen everything, and you, you will get confused. And crazy. So that is good, right? That we have limitations. Each creature has its own boundary or limitation, right? Anyway, so the sound waves will hit the eardrum or tympanic membrane. Make sense? One after another. And the eardrum will shake. And when the eardrum or tympanic membrane will shake, these three ossicles will shake. They are connected to each other. Okay? So they will vibrate, move like this. Clear? Because the first one, malleus, Second one, incus, third one, steps. Malleus is attached to the tympanic membrane, you see here. So when the tympanic membrane will shake like this, malleus will start to shake, right? Malleus is also attached to incus, incus is attached to the steps. steps. So all three ossicles will shake, right? Like this, right? And that is very important. These three ossicles work like liver. You know, liver in a big building when they use the crane, the pulley or lever, that amplifies the pressure many times. So the pressure hitting on the tympanic membrane is amplified by the movement of these three ossicles. Is it clear? So many times the pressure is amplified. And the other end of the steps, this is the steps, last ossicle, here you have oval window, another thin membrane. So this is the steps, and this is the oval window, oval shaped, very thin membrane attached like it. So when the ossicles are shaking, right? Also moving the oval window. Make sense? Oval window is moving. Did you get it? So this is important to know that sound pressure is amplified many times and hitting the oval window here. Now you see what happens. This is the cochlea, okay? And your oval window is here. Oval window, which is a membrane. And this is the steps. Then incus, malleus, ear drum. Okay? So three ossicles. And this is the ear drum. And this is the oval window here. And this is what? Cochlea. Killed with what? Fluid. Is that clear? So 
Now you see when this membrane oval window moves like this, waves are created in the fluid. Is it clear? So you have fluid here, so if I move this one, waves will be created in the fluid, the cochlear fluid. Okay. <clears throat> How does a cochlear implant work? Implant is like you know you uh, put an artificial cochlea, you make artificial cochlea, and put under the bone around the ear. Okay. Now, cochlea is a coiled structure, so I can make it straight. I can hold here and pull like this and make it straight. Okay. So if you make it straight and see inside, this is the cochlea. And now if you see inside, there are two membranes inside the cochlea. So two membranes separate the cochlea into how many chambers? If I put two partitions here, how many chambers you will get? Three. Three. Make sense? Three rooms, right? You will get. So you have three chambers and two membranes. The upper membrane is called vestibule.